in exercise, probably sat around. No, no, no. He was a fanatic gym guy. Went to the gym, ran. Perfect shape. Perfect blood pressure, low cholesterol, and he died anyway. You don't know where to go with that. You gag. But we all do it. I mean, anyone with a rational mind who has a, an orientation towards survival always asks sort of, do you do that? Robert, don't you know all the guys who do that? You don't do it at your age yet, right? At 28? No one does it yet. Working for me, the guys are going to wind up in a psychiatric ward fearing, fearing death and health problems. I'm trying to lighten you up, lighten up a little. It's Friday. It's been a long, heavy week, for God's sakes. Rubio now. Now, he's the leader. Look at this, what this country's come to. Look at this guy, a shill. A shill that they found in Miami selling ice cream with a bell. They made him a senator, now they think he can be president. Well, they know America, they're probably right. Why not? Why couldn't he be president? If a Barack Obama could become president, why not Marco Rubio? What's the difference between the two of them? Marco Rubio would have come with a warning label. Hello, I am just a frat boy, I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, he looks like a cheerleader, all he needs is a megaphone, he could be in a 1940s movie. A big letter on his chest with a megaphone. That, he, he has that look. A lot of women like him. He has that boyish look. They trust him. Say, oh, come on, I'm not that kind of woman. Don't. Uh, people will go for looks. There's Chuck Todd. You know, beards generally look good on men. Chuck Todd ought to really ditch that beard. On him, it looks like it came from a theatrical shop in order to give him some gravitas, which he could never have. Fake beards do not give you gravitas, Chuck. You need a brain. There's something missing in your DNA. All right, line two, Marlon. No one cares about politics. Marlon, what's on your mind? Dr. Savage, I thank you, sir. Um, I've been trying to reach you for several months now, get through. Oh. I grew up in the streets of Oakland, San Francisco, and I was a member of the Demo Liberal Plantation. I served in the Air Force, and I started listening to you. Um, since listening to you, my life has changed in good ways. Uh, wow. Really that's, that's an amazing statement because I, in the Bay Area, I mean, I basically know who listens to me, I would think, but I don't. So obviously you're not a member of the demographic I'm talking about, are you? No. I'm, um, hey, I, I, went, I graduated Mission High School. I'm a black man who I have two kids, and I'm taking care of my kids. I'm taking care of my wife, my family. And so what, well, so what, what, okay, let, let's go back. Everyone wants to hear this when they do radio. And I don't want to indulge myself any, any more than I normally do, but I want to ask you a question. How long ago did you start listening to me in San Francisco on KSFO? About, uh, about a year and a half ago. Okay, but I've been on 21 years. You know that. So at first you, what, you hate, at first you hated me? No, I, I really, you were just, you were somebody that I would hear on the radio from someone else's, on someone else's desk, you know, and... <laughs> To me, you were just another radio talk show host until um, this particular coworker started telling me, he's, listen, he's not like the others. He's not like um, this. I don't want to mention any names, but you know what I'm talking about. No, no, we, we can't mention any other names. So, okay, I struck a chord with you. And what is it that you heard in me, given that you were born on the plantation here of the Democrat Socialist Plantation in San Francisco, run by Willie Brown, Nancy Pelosi, Barbara Boxer, Diane Feinstein, and Jerry Brown? What allowed you to break free of the propaganda? You have a message, and everything that you say, there's a message that you send out, sometimes directly, sometimes not, and not so directly. But it's, you, 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 you often say, you know what, don't look at the other. Don't look at any politicians or any of these people to free you or to liberate you. Liberate yourself. Right. You know? That's right. Ultimately, we hold the key to our own servitude in our own hands. Back to school, I got my degree. I have a um, good-paying job, and I have. Well, were you were you ever incarcerated? Was I ever incarcerated? Yes, I was. Because it, it, see, it says I saved you from a life of crime. Had you been incarcerated? How long ago? Uh, twenty-two years ago. Okay, how many years did you do? Did seven years for robbing and. Uh, doing some bad things to a drug dealer. So let me ask you something. When you're in prison, you talk to people. You have a lot of time on your hands. And you talk very real in prison, don't you? There's no room for even so much as one word that's wrong because you can get killed if you start, you know. Isn't it true that you talk to each other in a certain realistic way? 
to, to certain people, yeah, there's there's a stigma that everyone who's locked up is, is stupid. There's a lot of people in prison who are not stupid. They just made stupid decisions. Oh, I know that very well. I had a man on this show 10, 15 years ago. I won't mention his name. Very nice man. He was arrested for mortgage fraud 20 years ago. He was a very wealthy man, lived in Marin County. They took his home, seized all his assets. They put him in San Quentin. He came on this show. White guy, middle-class white guy, was worth a lot of money, lost everything, went to jail, and he said that he survived in prison by becoming basically a legal uh, uh, researcher for the toughest gang member in prison. They protected him, and he said there is a way to survive in prison if you can provide a service for somebody in that regard. It's not all what everyone thinks it is. I'm sure you, you, you can uh, verify that that's, that's a fact. And what I'm saying by telling that story again on the show is that I'm, I'm acknowledging we're all one mistake away from prison in this over-politicized, over-penalized nation. That's right. We are. And, and for those who are there, those who, who have been there, that's not the end of the road. You know what? You have to learn from your mistakes. You know, I never turned back. I never looked back. I never returned to that. And um, once I started listening to you, I, I, I'd say I was in third gear. Just to Interesting. You. So you make a good living. You support your wife and kids, and you're calling to say that you enjoy talk radio. And again, I'm not looking for a loyalty oath. I wouldn't even ask you who you're going to vote for, but I'll ask you who you're going to vote for. <laughs> Let, let's say, uh, let's put it this way: I don't know whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Let's put that aside. Looking at the men on the stage, including Carly Fiorina, uh, who would you say is the most appealing to you, and why? Well, well, you know, there's a saying, Doctor Savage: common sense ain't common. And the person who's most appealing to me is Donald Trump. And why? Because he's the same person. He is the same person. He doesn't switch up. He tells it like it is. And he can relate to everything and everybody. He's not a, he's not a politician. I like that. Interesting. Now, here is a... <laughs> I don't have to have repeat and summarize you know, what your demographic is and what, what your background is. You're the opposite of what the media would say is an individual who would be attracted to Donald Trump. But when I had him on this show two times ago, did you catch the interview with him Monday by any chance? Uh, no, I did not. I was. Oh, he was on. It was unbelievable. But two times ago, I said to him, I understand that by the latest poll, 25% of African Americans say they're going to vote for you. I said, Donald, that means that the number is probably closer to 50% because many people will be ashamed to tell a pollster that they would vote for you. What do you see in your community with regard to that statement? In the black community, I see blacks leaning towards Donald Trump. They, they speak positively of him, but like you said, a lot of people don't, they, they don't have the strength to speak up and speak their mind. That's why you have That's to amazing. That, you know, and you know why? I said on this show, Donald, Marlon, I'm sorry, one of the reasons he appeals to ethnic minorities, Hispanics, blacks, etc., even gay people, is because they're so used to being lied to by politicians that they'll take a guy who they think is telling the truth, even if they don't agree with all of his policies. Wouldn't you say that that sort of summarizes his appeal? That summarizes it. You know, I, I refer to, to the Democratic Party as the demo-liberal plantation because so many blind people are part of it and continue to be part of it to their detriment. Well, Marlon, I'm so thrilled that you have KSFO as a resource here in San Francisco. I've been on the station for so many years. I was one of the first hosts when they actually I was the first host on it when it was created in 1994. I'm sending you a copy of my book Government Zero to open up not only open your eyes which are wide open, but to give you the information you need to talk to other people. Marlon, thanks for those kind comments. When I come back on the Savage Nation, we're going to talk about all of the other news of the day, and we have breaking news for you. Be here. What you're about to hear on the Savage Nation is pretty shocking because it's the State Department throwing Hillary Clinton under the bus. Her own advisors today said we didn't want to hold back any of these emails that they're saying they're holding back today. And yet here is her own State Department turning against her. And I told you what's going on. Let's listen to John Kirby's spokesmouth for the 
U.S. State Department. As part of this monthly FOIA production of former Secretary Clinton's emails, the State Department will be denying in full seven email chains found in 22 documents representing 37 pages. The documents are being upgraded at the request of the intelligence community because they contain a category of top secret information. Do you realize what the significance of this, folks? I know you're saying, well, well, what is it, Mike? No, don't ask me a question. It's very complicated. Some of the Clinton emails are so top secret that they cannot be released. We heard that already earlier this week. But this is something new. Her own campaign, as I just said, said, no, 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 we want them released because we can defend us having transmitted them. And here is her own spokesman from before she was really a serious candidate saying, oh, we can't release them. They're too damaging. U.S. declares 22 Clinton emails top secret. Could you believe this? What's going on in front of your eyes three days before Clinton competes in the Iowa presidential caucuses? What it indicates to me is that they're out. They want they're throwing her under the bus. I personally don't know how she gets the strength to handle this. To be frank, it's like I almost admire her fortitude. I would never, you know, I don't like her politics. But how can this woman at her age, with which she's putting up with, even if she's being exposed, how could she not run away and say, I quit, I resign? How can she take this? If she keeps this up, she's liable to be indicted. See, she's always gotten away with what she's gotten away with because she has the protexia she needs at all levels of government. But it seems to me this protection has just been lifted. Somebody above her has decided to designate what she, what she released as above top secret. And now uh, as we close the show with White Rabbit, it's time for me to do my Friday afternoon Bible reading. It's called A Still Small Voice because many of you don't know where it comes from. It comes from the Old Testament, 1 Kings. The Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still small voice. And Elijah heard it, and he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Savage.